Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. It's uh, what seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, now. I don't think we'll go five hours or anything like that. But I, I've got, I've I just got, want to do like a three or four parter. <laughs> I've got I've got a meeting in two hours, but I think we've got a lot of information we can go. So I think we can fill most of that time if it's okay okay with you guys. Um, oh cool. yeah, yeah, we're recording right now, Zach. Right? Yep. I just put us up. Yeah, I mean, I just got done doing my damn. I'm doing these 300 push-ups a day, so I, I hit. I, I'm doing five sets of 60 right now, so I, I'm up to 240 for the day. I'll knock out another 60 after, so I'm a little short of breath. Um, I was at the store buying brisket and a power washer and some other steaks, and I got to pay. I almost I was almost late. I was got to pay, and, and the people at the banks to contact your bank. So it was happening. You know, so a couple like uh, like three or four days ago, my card got you know fraud you know fraud fraud deal. Somebody got my number and was running up wrong charges. So I had to cancel the card. And they sent me a new one, and now they're like hyper vigilant about it. So yesterday uh, I was do, I was doing some stuff online. I was doing my taxes. I was paying it, and then it said card rejected. I was like, what the hell? I'm trying to pay my taxes. And then I call them and said, hey, no, that's me. That's me. And they were supposed to like take care of it, but they didn't. And so they had put a, they put a freeze in my car. So I was in line buying all this meat and I had to buy a power washer too. You know, those power washers to wipe the, spray the concrete and stuff. Get that in front of their house. And uh, this has nothing whatsoever to do with the carnival diet. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, just an influence of day. But yeah, so I had a waste. I was, I was holding up the whole Costco line and it was just like, you know, so I had to go and I was dealing with my bank, you know, yelling my social, you know, I had to yell my numbers. What's your, what's your, what's your ID? What's your favorite? Whatever, you know, trying to tell people it's kind of annoying. Like, what's your first pet's name? And all your that. First, <laughs> first car, you know, your, your first concert, all that stuff. My first concert, by the way, I probably shouldn't say this, but so hopefully nobody will steal my account, was Phil Collins. Remember Phil Collins? Yeah. 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 That was my first, kind of a wimpy first concert. But then I saw, after that, I saw, uh, uh, who are the guys with, uh, was it, uh, Oh, they had Eddie. It was uh, the big guy, the big, the big evil zombie that was called Eddie. God, what was his, what was that band's name? Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. Yeah, that was my second couch. It was such a big difference in the in the two uh, the two uh, the crowds because one was like Phil Collins, you know, like your yuppie, and then Iron Maiden was all these you know freaking degenerate druggies. And so, I mean, not that I'm into Iron Maiden. It's a funny group. But... I was like a 14 year old kid, and you're walking up there, everybody's trying to sell you dope and yeah, <laughs> experience. So. Yeah, we Not were supposed to have guns and roses. Yeah, no, that's good though. But so, Bar, we were supposed to have uh, a guy named Zeeshan Arain on this morning. He's a he's a he's a physician. Uh, he's a low carb physician. I think he's now t- trending carnivore uh, sports physician who is a I think he's for the Melbourne Demons AFL team, so the Australian Football League. So he was supposed to come on, but he messed it. We messed up the time zones or something. We couldn't do it. So we were going to have an all. Aussie New Zealand morning this morning, which would be cool. <laughs> right. and I know there's a there's that little rivalry there with the underhand bowling and stuff like that, right? I'm sure you're you're aware of that. Where the we will never forget that one. Sure, never forget that. The no. cheating. Never forget. Never forget. Yeah, I like, so, and Zach was in New Zealand earlier this year, and then I lived there for yeah. a while, played a couple seasons of rugby up in the Waikato. I'm not sure. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Ah, uh, I'm a Waikato boy myself. There you go. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. The Mulu guys. Yeah, I was in yeah, yeah, yeah. the yellow, yeah. the gold, the yellow, red, and black. I think it was like the German flag almost. But uh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, I got to play with some of these guys. It was like Richard Prim and Warren Gatlin and uh, Steve Rob Gordon. Some of these, uh, you know, All Blacks when I was playing. So I got to get on the field with those guys and knock heads with those. Guys, as an American, which wasn't bad, but I love New Zealand. Beautiful, beautiful country. And yep. we were just talking. You're on the you're on the tip of the North Island or tip of the South Island, North End up there in Nelson. Yes. Um, do you, I, I assume you grew up there. Is that correct? You're you're New Zealand born and bred. Uh, yeah, I am. I'm a Waikato boy, as I say, uh, right. from the Tron, from Mulu Town, so, uh, Hamilton. So, so Hamilton, yeah, because those was, was Hamilton old boys and, and Marist and uh, That's right. Fraser Tech were the teams in the league I played. I was playing for Hot Tapu in Cambridge. Okay. okay. Yeah. How tap. Yeah. Yeah, good. Tap. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They recruited me there to play. 
Anyway, Zach was in New Zealand earlier this year, toured around first time. I'd love to get back down there sometime. Dude. Yeah. Beautiful country. Yeah. My wife and I, we did uh, a lot around the Northern Island. We, did, we actually didn't even go to the Southern Island because we, we know we're going to go back, and we thought with the time we had, we'd do one island at a time. So. Well, we'll have to, Zach, you and I will have to go. We'll do, we'll do a carnivore trip down in the North, yeah. down in the South Island. Bart will meet us there. We'll go run around. We'll go see, what is it, Milford Sound and all the, all the stuff. Uh, all the beautiful listen, stuff there. boys, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a North Island boy. I was born and bred up there. I'm a Waikato boy, but if you have not seen the South Island, you have not seen New Zealand, my friends. Yeah, I got to yeah. get down there. I, 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 the, wow. the, the kiwi bird that I have behind me, I didn't. I was. I, I joked we were going to go hunt. When I was uh, when I was playing <laughs> rugby, there was a there was a uh, an old guy who was from Pataru. Pataru. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Pataru. Yep. Yeah. Pataru. Yeah, he was on the other team, and uh, he was like the manager or something. He wanted to take me hunting, big hunting out in the bush, and he was an old guy with a bad hip, and he would limp around. And I said, "Well, we're going to hunt some kiwis." He said, "No, I can't do that." But he was hunting around and he was like, he, you know, I, he, every time he got tired, he would tell me some Maori myth and legend about this or that plant. You know, they do, they, do, they tell you that and this and that. Mm. And he wanted mm. to eat his hoo-hoo grubs, little big worms. He wanted me to eat some of those. Yeah. Things. He could never catch any. Thankfully, I didn't find it. Oh, they, they, just, <laughs> they just taste like peanut butter. That's what they said. That's what like said. peanut butter. It was like peanut butter, yeah, but I never got huh. to eat it. So, see, someone can confirm I'm not making this stuff up, so. So, Bart, tell us a little bit about your background. I know you've got a nutrition P. PhD and something nutrition related. And I know you've been kind of stirring the pot a little bit saying a <laughs> yeah. bunch of crazy so, I don't know who yeah, else would do that, but my, uh, a little bit so we know, know who we're talking to. Okay. So my background uh, initially, I, I have three uh, advanced research degrees. Uh, the first two of which are actually in exercise physiology. Um, so human performance uh, at the elite end, uh, in that life, I did some work with the All Blacks, the New Zealand All Black rugby team, in terms of their uh, preparation for the 2011 World Cup, uh, the successful campaign they ran down here in New Zealand. Uh, I've done some work with the NRL, the, the rugby league referees. Um, I was actually a rugby league referee myself uh, at a high level for about 15 years. Uh, I worked with both the Australian and New Zealand elite SAE forces in terms of getting them ready for, you know, the situations that they're going to put the, the soldier boys into, um, that, that kind of stuff. Um, also along those lines, you know, I did some work in, in obviously the nutrition area uh, and obviously, you know, what I was taught and, and trained was the same as everybody else and that is you know avoid saturated fat base your diet on 60 percent uh, complex carbohydrates uh the cholesterol is the devil and you know all this ridiculous nonsense basically this is 20 years ago uh now sean um you know you'd think things had moved on since then but you know not so much um they're still teaching it today unfortunately there you go um then uh, after the sort of exercise physiology, I, I taught that um, for you know, 10, 12 years. And then for the last three years of my academic career, I kind of branched out into the more medically based uh, area, I guess. And I taught uh, cardiovascular pathophys uh, to um, pre-med students and um, NHS, future NHS employees up in the UK there. Um, so that was, that was kind of what we did, you know, obviously, and, and, and while I was an academic, I sort of published a number of articles in a number of areas, uh, including physiology and nutrition and statistics, uh, did some pure statistics type papers and things like that, I published a couple of book chapters, um, but yeah, you know, I came, it came pretty much to the, to the, uh, to the same conclusion that you did in terms of the carnivorous diet. Um, well, I was keto for about 20 years um, before I kind of went the full carnival thing. And it was actually when I was kind of leaving academia about the end of the academic year 2016 that I was kind of looking for, well, what am I going to do now? Because I was, I was leaving academia at that point. I was, I was sick of the way things were being run. I was sick of them trying to bully me and tell me what I could and couldn't say. And... Um, I was refusing to get up in front of fee paying students and tell them what I know to be untruths. Um, I was not popular because I was standing up for myself and, you know, really stirring the pot quite hard as it were. 
so I was leaving academia. That was the end of that. I was going to do my own thing. Uh, YouTube was going to be the thing. Um, so uh, I was kind of doing some research. Okay, what am I going to do? And I came across this crazy doctor called Sean Baker, uh, who was doing this carnival thing. And uh, so I looked into that a bit further and went, you know, actually, this makes a lot of sense. Um, checked out everything he had to say. It all checked out. Came across the Petersons, of course. Uh, and then the next character I came across was Frank Tufano. So it was like, oh, well, there you go. Um, so I, I kind of started out my channel, I think it was about September, October last year. Uh, and since then, I've kind of, I've, I've gathered a, a bit of, a, a bit of uh, moss. I ain't no rolling stone. Uh, I've got a bit of, a, a bit of notoriety, but purely by, uh, you know, being prepared to, to be a bit confrontational and to sort of, say to some of these people, hey, you know, actually, you're claiming to be standing on the, on the academic high ground, you're claiming to be, you know, for coming from a position of the science being behind you, uh, you know, let's discuss that. So um, that's kind of what I've, where I've come from, what I've been doing, yeah. Hey, hey Bart, I want to jump in with something you mentioned, because I find it really interesting, because you said you had a background in, uh, like, working with professional athletes, essentially. Yeah. Um, and uh, you said that you started a keto diet 20 years ago. And I think uh, the first thing that popped in my mind, and I'm guessing will pop into a lot of our listeners' minds is, well, 20 years ago is well, well beyond kind of that wave of the more modern ketogenic uh, movement, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. Um, yeah. And then when you look at sports performance, especially when we get into the professional side of things, from my experience, the folks that are going to slap down the ketogenic diet the quickest are going to be the exercise phase folks with or are working with the pro athletes, the Olympians, yeah. those sort of. So yeah. what drew you to it in the kind of contact in, in that environment, I guess, more or less. Um, in the first instance, it was the fact that none of the pseudoscience they were peddling and pushing and teaching us made any kind of sense to me whatsoever. The whole idea that, uh, fats are bad, saturated fats are even worse, that you require carbohydrates for, for muscle metabolism, all of that only works if you believe stepwise the story that they tell in terms of the way muscles work, the, the physiology that underpins exercise performance, all that kind of stuff. I've always been one of these people who has always challenged absolutely everything that, that comes to me information wise and check everything out. And it did not make sense. Okay. The whole idea that what and they used to teach, and I think they still do teach that there were three discrete energy systems, um, two of which are, are so-called anaerobic and one is so-called aerobic. Uh, an actual fact, if you want to think of it that way, there aren't three, there are four, uh, three of which are so-called anaerobic and one is aerobic. In actual fact, none of them are anaerobic. They're all aerobic. Uh, they're not discrete systems. They're different gears in one overall system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, as it turns out, um, it was at that stage that I was kind of working out, well, hang on, via gluconeogenesis, you can create all the glucose you need to basically provide the muscles with all the starch they need. Um, yes, it's true that muscles require some starch to, to function at any level of intensity, actually, not just the high level. Um, but you don't need to, you don't need to get those carbs from your diet, you know, uh, directly. You, you can make those carbs out of, you know, basically fats. Uh, and then, you know, I'd, I'd never sort of sucked up the idea that, that saturated fat was bad for you. It made no sense to me whatsoever. There was no science behind the idea that saturated fat is, or, or cholesterol, in fact, is going to cause you any kind of trouble. Um, and there still isn't, by the way. Uh, after all these years of looking really hard for it, it just still does not exist. Um, so that's, yeah, that's why my kind of tenure, I guess, in, in academia was limited to the 15 to 17 years or so that it was, because basically it, you can only take so many years of, of people trying to bully you and tell you that you, 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 know, you can't stand up in front of students and say something that's completely um, at odds with the accepted wisdom. And I'm saying, well, hey, I'm not the problem, Charlie Brown. The problem is the accepted wisdom because it's bloody nonsense. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where, where I got to with that. Um, you know, as it was, uh, you know, back then 20 years ago when I was, when I was eating high-fat, low-carb, 
you know, obviously that that was that was a big mistake on my part because actually what happened is about uh, 18 years ago I died of an of an MI, uh, and that was tragic for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's clear that it's clear that it happened. It shows that you know the people that say that eating a low carb diet is unsustainable is clearly. I mean, we see evidence every day that that's not the case. One one point I'd just like to, to flesh out. I mean, because you, you talk about gluconeogenesis being sufficient to fuel muscle glycolytic activity, and, and I certainly agree with that because I do. I demonstrate it every single day. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you mentioned fat being turned into, into glucose. I, my understanding is that amino acids are even more effective at doing that. And so you've got protein in there as well. As well. And so, sure, sure. You know, we can, we can use a glycerol molecule and convert that into glucose. Um, you know, that, that, that is a very interesting, you know, concept. And I think it's something that uh, I've seen, you know, going from a, you know, and Zach and I've talked about this with a number of protein researchers, Stuart, Stuart Phillips, uh, we had on um, Don Lehman recently, Jose Antonio talking about how muscles actually built are built, and it's not with carbohydrates, with it's with you know amino acids, obviously, and leucine being one of the drivers there. But we talked about um, the fact that, uh, in fact, our our, our uh, talk with Don Lehman was very interesting, looking at animals on high protein diets and how well they are able to refill their glycogen stores via protein. Mm -hmm. And, and when they're on a high carbohydrate diet, what they see during an overnight fast is their glycogen stores drop out because their body sucks that glycogen out and then they have to, they have to refeed themselves. And so when you're not, you're not in that situation, when you're not in a high carb situation, the glycogen stores, you know, particularly if you're eating enough protein, seem to seem to take care of themselves. And again, speaking of all blacks, we've got, I'm sure you're familiar with Owen Frank. So Owen Frank's one, yeah. one of your players, uh, unfortunately, he's yeah. had an injury. Uh, recently, so he's, he's he's got a messed up shoulder, but he's been on a carnivore diet for a year and a half now, and obviously performing at one of the highest levels, you know, arguably. I mean, you know, certainly a, a New Zealand All Black knows what it's like to do high level athletics. Mm. Uh, let me, because there's one thing, and we're going to get Zoe Harcom on here, I think, tomorrow to talk about this, but I think this point is extremely, extremely important. When you talk about flawed science or you know, I mean, you, you, you say the science or the scientific dogma almost scathingly as though it's, there's something wrong. What is your, and, and I kind of know where you're going. I, I, I tend to agree with you, particularly when it comes to epidemiology. What do you see being the, 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 the major problem with much of our knowledge as gained uh, around nutrition right now? Is there, is there a problem the way we collect the data or what's going on with that? Yeah, you bet. Um, my, my opinion, my personal opinion, be it humble or otherwise, is that science is a discipline and the disciplines in science require us to conduct ourselves within very strict, very, if you like, rigid frameworks of conduct, how it is that we generate um, what we believe to be the model of, of some kind of objective truth that science is supposed to uh, provide for us and and as such science I, I i tend to gravitate towards a very narrow definition of what is science myself having been involved in academia for 17 years having seen the good the bad the ugly and the extremely ugly in terms of you know what is what is put forward by various so-called academics having sat on the editorial boards of three different journals in my time um assessing papers sent in by other academics that want to get their work published and things. My definition of science has become very clear, and that is that science is, number one, experimental. Okay, so observational stuff is fine. Observational stuff can inform where the science needs to go, where the investigations need to be made, but observations cannot inform on the knowledge in and of themselves. It's the old adage that, that you talk Anytime you walk into any um, school, pretty much anywhere in the world, on day one of your first undergraduate degree, they're going to they're going to say to you within half an hour, you know, correlation cannot establish causality, not now and not ever. Um, and at the end of the day, what you've got with the epidemiology is a bunch of associative data. This is associated with that, which is presented with malice of forethought in a manner that is designed to have the reader believe that this is a scientific it's not 
and b it's evidence for some kind of mechanism it's not and c that it proves a point which it does not hey bar let me let me let me interrupt your train of thought here because i think you yeah. know this is an important concept you know we you know so much so many of us have heard you know correlation does not equal causation we've got that but there's something that I think there's an important thing, and we'll talk more about this with Zoe Harcum tomorrow. Um, when you see lack of correlation, that mm. is to say, if we see studies that show red meat is not related to colon cancer, and we see that in, in, the, in the literature quite frequently, quite honestly, there's numbers of studies that show that, mm. that may have more power than, than, than something that does have a positive correlation. That is to say, a negative correlation tends to rule out causation, does it not? Or is there some, am I, am I misreading that? Um, it, it's not an absolute, but it's, it's a pretty strong case. Um, whereas to say something is correlated is a very piss weak case. To say that something is not correlated is much more powerful, although not definitive in terms of ruling out causality. There may be confounds, there may be things that are, that are causing the data set to become skewed one way or another, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, one of the things I've, I've taught in my time is, is statistics and research methodology as well, to the point where my students used to hate me because I would not allow them to use software to calculate their statistics. What I made them do was do every single statistical calculation that they did longhand on a piece of paper and show they're working. And all of those students actually in, in years to come have you got back to me, those that have commented at all and said, actually, thank you very much for making me do that. Now I understand how the water's being pulled over people's eyes, what's going on. So uh, when I talk about statistics as well, I, I guess the caveat there is I'm talking from a position of knowing a little bit about how these, you know, what the math is, you know, I can get out a piece of paper and do a, an ANOVA on a piece of paper with a calculator and a pencil, you know, most academics can't do that. So, there's that and uh, one of the issues that you get with with these the whole way that science is presented is a thing called positivism and it's the whole either p is less than 0 0.05 for example uh, therefore it's a real thing and it's publishable or p is greater than 0 0.05 in which case that does not exist and it does not get published it ends up in someone's bottom drawer so you get publication bias which is absolutely rife in, in epidemiology um, you, you get papers that are based on a, a bunch of findings that are, are weak positives, but none of the equally you know, weak negatives or even the stronger negatives, none of those actually show up in that analysis because they're in someone's bottom drawer because you can't publish that, um, which is just you know, a, a ridiculous way of going about doing science. I mean, Finding out that something is not correlated to something else, surely that's as useful as finding out that it is, if not more so. The science doesn't see it that way. Science says, if you want to publish something, you have to show us something is so. Um, it's a mistake. It's a big, big mistake. So there's that. There's uh, the, the habit of talking about associations and correlations as being causal or inferring that they're causal. You know, uh, fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, a completely pseudoscientific approach to to phenomenology. It's 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 ridiculous. It's nonsense. Yeah, and I and I saw your your little discussion you had with Dr. Garth Davis, who is definitely not a fan of my particular style of uh, of, of advocacy. Mm -hmm. as, as I as I'm very very readily willing to engage in propaganda, knowing full well that it needs to be done. Uh, besides the science, you know, and so. Mm. But I mean, one of the things he would point out is saying, "Well, Bart, that's the best we have." We just got to make do with it. And, and you sort of disagree with that. Yeah, I do. I mean, let's go back to my original uh, overpending, overarching statement. Science is a discipline. People are required to behave with discipline if they want to be considered scientific. If we do not have evidence for causality, then we cannot suggest that causality is in play. We have to be disciplined. We have to say, well, look, we have this association. This is linked with that in a, in a coincidental fashion. But hey, drownings and swimming pools are connected very, very strongly with movies put out by Nicolas Cage. So if we want to prevent swimming 
drownings or drownings in swimming pools, surely then all we need to do is ban Nicolas Cage from making any further movies. Now, while personally I'd be a fan of that, that, <laughs> will not affect, that would not affect drownings in swimming pools, will it? No. And that's, that's as good as it gets in epidemiology. And the way that they blind folks, both academic and non-academic actually, is by using mathematics that people cannot understand. That's not accessible. It's white coat stuff, basically. Let's intimidate people by talking in a mathematical language that they cannot access, they cannot understand. Therefore, they will not challenge us. Bart, let me, you know, obviously you have reached a decision or a conclusion that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, and I would say, you know, from, if we want to generate hypotheses, you know, we can use epidemiology to generate an hypothesis. We can use an evolutionary knowledge to generate an hypothesis too. And I think you, there's a lot of ways to generate, we can use anecdotes, anecdotal mm -hmm. uh, observations to generate hypotheses, all hypothesis generation. But then you talk about science, you need evidence. Mm -hmm. What is the evidence that you would say is real evidence that you can conclude that human beings should eat a meat-based diet. I mean, where is the evidence pro if, if you say there's no evidence, you know, the other way? Yeah. I mean, the science in terms of investigations into the carnivorous diet in human beings is very young. There is very little available. And the reason for that is because basically for the last hundred years, so the powers that be have been lying to us with malice and forethought. They have been feeding us misinformation. They have been misguiding us. They have been giving us false, dangerous information. And it's become so entrenched that all the research is in that area. All the research compares, you know, uh, things like a, a vegetarian or a vegan diet to the standard diet. There's no direct comparisons between those diets or indeed the standard diet and the carnivorous diet as yet. Um, what, what we need in, in time to come, and hopefully this happens quickly, is we need a number, a good number of well-powered, well-designed, well-controlled, um, random order crossover clinical studies and, and we, need this, we need this data to come in in volumes so that we can then start talking about the scientific inference. And at the end of the day, a scientific inference is, is a statistical inference. It is a, here is the weight of inference. I mean, I don't even like the word evidence in science. Science can't even prove that we exist, Sean. Uh, what, what we can do, though, is say, like, statistically, here is the likelihood that this particular data set, which is powerfully weighted one way or another, whether that happened by chance alone or whether this is a real, there's something behind this. And then the responsibility of the scientists, once we've got one of those relationships, is to go in and make an, you know, find out the mechanism. What is causing this? Why does this happen? And, and then that's the full picture flesh, fleshed out at that point. Once we can say, look, the statistical inference is powerful. It's very strong. Here is the mechanism that underpins it. We've observed this mechanism in play, in situ, in human beings, not in a test tube, not in a computer simulation, real world stuff, you know. Um, now we're pretty sure we know what's going on here. That's what's required. Uh, until that point, what, what people need to do is say, we have a hypothesis, okay? The cholesterol hypothesis. It's wrong, but it's a hypothesis. It's not a fact, for example. Hey, Barb, before we run down that rabbit hole, and I think we should, um, mm -hmm. I want to just, you know, back up because, you know, you said, you know, for 100 years, that there's been a sort of a nefarious force that has been sort of steering us in the wrong direction. And my question to you would be, I mean, if, if who is behind that? If we say it's these big food companies, and, and they have an influence on how the studies come. Why do we see studies out there that say vegetarian or vegan may look favorable? Why don't we see standard American diet as the healthiest diet in the world coming out in, in these in these studies? If, if, it, if it's truly those guys, because it seems like, you know, Nestle and Nabisco and, and these big cookie and, and these companies that might have the money, you know, mm -hmm. we would see these studies showing standard American diet as the best diet on the planet. Why, why don't we see that? 
I think we don't see it because the the vegan agenda is, is strong. I think the force is strong with them. I think they have massive financial resources behind them. Um, it's, it's big agriculture. Uh, big agriculture has more, more money in it than obviously, um, you know, big meat concerns or, or any of those kind of concerns. Um, it was them in the first instance that paid off the scientific fraternity to point the finger of blame at fat in the first place, rather than away from sugar, because obviously they were producing, you know, carbohydrate rich, sugar rich type um, foods. Um, I, th I think that there is probably a, um, a subjugation of the masses thing going on here. Um, we, we like to think in today's you know, day and age that, that we're not subject to that kind of thing. That's a thing of the past. That's a mistake. We're subject to it right here and right now. Just look at the health statistics and you see, you know, we're all, you know, still playing their game basically by their rules. Um, uh, big Pharma gets in as, as well because obviously Big Pharma has a vested interest in people being sick. Uh, you know, you name me one a pharmacological drug that's being produced by any company anywhere in the world anytime that cures any disease and I'll eat my hat. Yeah, I mean, but, some, people, but, some people would say antibiotics have been beneficial in bacterial infections, but I mean, um, you know, I think the, 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 to your point, you know, and, and Don Lehman pointed this out on Twitter a while ago, talking about advertising budgets, you know, like, you know, big egg, quote unquote, big egg spent like $10 million in revenue. Mm. You can tra contrast it to come like Coca-Cola, which spent something like three or $4 billion. And, you know, we've, we've seen these companies massively overspend. So we certainly see it in the advertising. I'm just wondering where we see the influence when it comes into research and, 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 and putting these studies out. But, um, you know, I think, I don't know where you want to go. I mean, there's a lot of topics we can cover. I mean, I do want to get into some of the stuff that I'm not familiar with or as familiar with. And I know you've talked about um, grounding and, and so you've got a little bit of knowledge on deuterium, which somebody like Jack Cruz or Lazo Boris uh, yeah. has been advocating. So we might want to just, just delve into that topic a little bit, kind of get a, maybe a superficial air, but let's, let's kind of beat up on uh, the diet heart hypothesis and you call it a hypothesis. What is the, uh, what is the reason that we would think that that hypothesis may not stand up? Uh, well, it doesn't stand up because number one, there's no mechanism to support it. And that's what I was talking about a few minutes ago when I said, actually at the end of the day, it is the responsibility of the scientists proposing, uh, that a certain phenomena is in play to actually explain that with a mechanism. So, Bob, uh, let me interrupt you just because the, yeah. the mechanism that is proposed is these LDL particles are able to, you know, breach the endothelial layer of the vascular, vascular cells and, and, and therefore begin the propagation of an atheroma. And, and, and you, mm. that's, that's their mechanistic, you know, and it's a, it's a mass diffusion gradient. The more LDL particles there are, it's mm. a diffusion effect. And so that's their proposed mechanism. So what say you to that? Uh, well, number one, nonsense, um, basically. <laughs> Um, it, for any form of lipoprotein to become inveigled into the vascular epithelial cells, you need loosened gap junctions. Uh, and that occurs as a result of systemic inflammation and or physical mechanical damage to the epithelial cells. So that's a, a function usually of hypertension uh, also of uh, systemic irritants, uh, such as, for example, oxalates, that uh, would be a big one. Um, all manner of other anti-nutrients, naturally occurring pesticides, uh, pro-inflammatory situations, all those kind of things. I mean, when, when we talk about it being a mass diffusion gradient, then um, usually the first question I then ask someone, I say, well, okay, great. The, the venous blood would contain the, uh, the same lipoproteins as the arterial blood, would it not? Yep, okay. Why then are atherosclerotic lesions only found on the high pressure side of the vasculature? Yeah, and I've seen Malcolm Kendrick make that same argument. And, you know, and, I, and mm. I guess, again, just to continue to sort of be the devil's advocate, they say, well, you know, maybe you need both, maybe you need pressure, 
plus plus a diffusion gradient and, and okay great still doesn't eliminate the diffusion gradient it just says you've got mm-hmm. more than one more than one factor that that's you know so that's involved in, in forming atherosclerotic disease, which is clearly the case there's many yeah people, you know fantastic so then my next point when someone says that to me is i say well okay great if it's pressure plus ldl then why aren't atherosclerotic lesions ubiquitous in the high pressure side yeah, then the next the next thing they say was well it would be the twists and turns and the different the different uh, okay so now we're talking about a temporal thing we're talking yeah. about turbulence as well right. so now you need now you need a, an amount of time for this particle to get into this gap junction that's loosened the analogy I use is uh, driving down the street standing on a bus hanging onto the rail with the door open the bus is going at fifty and you have to jump off the bus at the right time to land between a gap between two shops on the main street, as opposed to the same task, only let's slow the bus down to 10 mile an hour. Well, I mean, you know, like I said, if you're talking about venous flow versus arterial flow, which is obviously high pressure versus low pressure, um, you know, but people would argue that, well, you know, we get atheromas, they occur, and we always have high pressure arteries, and we always have low pressure venous systems, and there's always these branch points, and the turbulent flow is all pretty much always going to be there. Mm. So that those become sort of factors that don't really matter because they're always there. Although you could say that high pre- hypertension, which increases that, that pressure, certainly mm. is associated with elevations in, in cardiovascular risk. So let's continue, yeah. to, let's continue to, to, to yeah. bounce back and forth. So then the next thing you look at is, well, okay, they have done some um, investigations around these lesions. They've excised some of these lesions from cadavers, for example. Um, People have have passed away and they've gone, well, let's let's get in there. Let's let's dig these things out and see what's in them. And they go, oh, look, there's cholesterol there. Okay, so to which there are a couple of corrections. Number one, no, the bloody isn't cholesterol there. There's oxidized LDL, not native LDL, never native. In fact, native LDL moves through the vascular epithelial cells by phagocytosis, basically. It moves right through cells all the time. It's there all the time. It's a natural, normal event. It's not an invading thing. Your body is expecting that. Your body generated that LDL by itself, it's native to your body. Why the hell would your body react to it? It's there for a reason. Well, your we body have, reacts. We have receptors on the cells that, that, that do that, correct? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if, if it wasn't supposed to be there, why, you know, number one, why would you have genes encoding for the metabolic enzymes that produce cholesterol in the first place? And B, why would you have more DNA that encodes for proteins that are cell receptors on the cell membranes to get the stuff in and out of the cells. Okay. It, it, it's crazy to think of the stuff as the devil. Um, it's, it's generated by your body for a reason, for a purpose. And the purpose is, you know, well, there are myriad purposes for, for cholesterol in your body. But anyway, that aside, the cholesterol that is found in atherosclerotic plaques is invariably chemically deranged. It is oxidized, it is glycated, or both. It is not the native LDL that your body generated. So right there, when you say there is a connection between LDL and atherosclerosis, again, using a disciplined, scientific, logical approach to the argument, you have to say that is the end of the argument right there. No, there isn't. There is a connection between oxidized and glycated LDL and heart disease. All right, Bart, I'm going to continue. And, and trust me, I, 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 I sort of fully support what you're saying. And I, and I think there's a lot more behind uh, to, to heart disease and just how much LDL particles. But, you know, the critics would say, okay, let's say all things are equal. Let's say you are in, a, you are in some sort of metabolic state where you're going to tend to oxidize your LDL particles. You're going mm-hmm. to tend to glycate them. You've got a crappy diet. You're diabetic, whatever. You know, you're, you're, you're dealing with a lot of oxidative stress. Doesn't the fact that you have more LDL particles, even in that situation, increase your risk? Or is it still just a, is it still a nonlinear, just, you know, whether it's oxidative or not? I mean, obviously there are, 
examples of people that have heart attacks with very low levels of LDL. There are people that live with very high levels of LDL that do not have heart attacks. But again, the, 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 the mass diffusion people would say that all things being equal, yeah. you're still going to have a higher risk with higher right. LDL particle count. So let's turn that argument on its head and look at that another way and say, okay, what happens to someone's risk if we lower their LDL? And the answer is the risk doesn't change. Yeah, it depends which study you read. I mean, I know certainly the, uh, you know, the people that make the, uh, what is it, the uh, P PCSK9 inhibitors and the, uh, some of the statin literature will indicate there is a risk, although they play, as you know, they play with statistics heavily yep. to get those yep. numbers there. So again, there are people that would argue that there is evidence that shows that, you know, and, I, and, and that's where I think people get confused. Yeah, and they're, they're confused by, by academics being allowed to say those things and being allowed to publish those things. It's confusing because in academia, the authority is peer review. And basically to get an article published in the scientific literature, basically what you have to do is get it past an editor and two peer reviewers who that editor believes to be expert, whether they are or not, actually. Um, there is no magical truth in an article that is published in a scientific journal. It has no um, canonical, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a biblical text or anything like that. It's just some words put on paper by someone that three other people couldn't find fault with. And usually they couldn't find fault with it because they weren't competent to find that fault because it's, it's almost invariably there. For example, the people that are say, for example, like the PSK9 inhibitors, except the one that you mentioned there, what they completely fail to mention is the probably more than half a dozen confounders to that. In other words, the, the population of people who are given the PSK9 uh, inhibitors have lower systemic blood pressure. Okay, so the fact that they also have lower cholesterol is now irrelevant because you can't excise out which is which. That these are these are things that are intertwined. Okay, they have lower circulating triglycerides. Okay, they had different rates of type two diabetes. That these were not two populations of people who, at the outset, were inherently the same. So that's not science. You can't compare apples and pears and say, you know, now we've got oranges, for example. It's just ridiculous. Um, it, it's, the, what it is is people who are claiming to be scientific, people who are scientists because they are in science, but who are claiming to be scientific, who are actually um, shills for an industry. Okay? They have a source of research funding. And, and the people that are giving them hundreds of thousands of dollars to do their research are looking for a certain outcome. And it, it, is, it behooves the scientist to, um, to make the payment in terms of the, what the conclusion of the paper says. Yeah, I mean, it, that sounds very conspiratorial. And, you know, there's, there's probably, I'm, I'm sure there's many, many good scientists out there that, that may not participate in this sort of thing. And, but, you know, I, in, in the book I wrote, you know, I, I referenced a guy named Marsha, Marsha Angle, who was a former New England Journal of Medicine chief editor and she's first female to ever do that. And she left and she said she was, she was very, she regretted to say that she could not trust any of the data mm -hmm. that was published in these journals because of the incredible amount of commercial influence and bias that, yeah. that just happened. Science, so, science so, is bastardized and corrupted beyond belief, Sean. It's, it's, you know, and this is coming from someone who spent his, well, the first part of his professional life ensconced in that, fighting against that, um, you know, for one, you know, and excuse my language, the fuckery is real. It's very, very real. Yeah, Bart, if I can just jump in real quick here, because uh, <clears throat> I want to kind of reflect back to the, the interview or discussion you had with uh, Garth Davis and yeah, the part of that interview, and I do hope you guys do more of those. I think that was pretty interesting. Yeah, me um, too, but he seems to have gone to ground. He, I, uh, I yeah. Well, <laughs> I, 
Maybe my suspicions then are accurate with that because what I was waiting for more or less when I was watching that was kind of one or two things like either he would get to a point where he actually presented some form of evidence that I hadn't seen before that was compelling enough to get me to make a change Mm. or he would get to where he ultimately did which was to say well this is the best we have yeah (laughs) when Mm. I heard him say that the first thing that came to my mind is like so you're the authority on nutrition that I'm supposed to put my faith in and your response is well this is the best we have so what that tells the non-scientific non-doctor person like myself is that the people that are supposed to know the most are at a point where it's like yeah we, we just really don't know so as someone who wants to take my own personal responsibility that tells me well then i need to find out what's going to work for me myself yeah. and not necessarily tie my beliefs to any one study or one association or one blue zone or anything like that so that you know that kind of it, it almost was almost a relief to hear that because then I was like, well, I know a lot about how certain foods respond to my body when I'm assessing it. And I know that I'll get pushback for this where it's like, you know, you'll, you'll say, well, I feel better when I do this. And, and some people will say, well, that's a, that's a horrible way to assess your health. But, you know, I like to think I dive in a little deeper than just like, I feel good. It, you know, I look at things like how well am I sleeping? What's my mood like? What's my energy like? what do I feel like when I'm training at hundred percent capacity? Am I, you know, I, there's a lot of little nuances that you can kind of pick up when you pay attention to your body on a regular basis and you can somewhat tease out other things and, and lean on other changes you've made when you hold something's constant. But it seems like that's kind of where we're at, where it's uh, you know, we're left to do the best we can and personally assess how we're feeling using some of these like kind of more grand uh, scope type of metrics like sleep quality, energy levels. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's, there's some modern technology too, like you go and get a CAC scan or something like that, or a well-timed blood test, maybe if you're in the right position with it, you know, doing the protocol properly and stuff like that, and mm. uh, that you can maybe lean on a little bit. But am I on the right base here or is there, do you have a yeah. comment to that or, or what are your thoughts? No, look, look I, I, I agree with you. I think that for, for far too long, um, we have deified anybody in a white coat. Uh, and we have, by proxy, we have deified the peer-reviewed literature as being inviolate and incapable of erroneous assertion-making. We have considered science to be a dispassionate, um, uncorruptible and uncorrupt institution we believe in science okay and in that we are all incredibly naive okay the the process that was put forward for science the way science ought to be done um is 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 pretty you know pretty flawless in terms of what it can do and how it should be communicated about and unfortunately it's not the science that's the problem. It's the people in the science who have lost the discipline to constrain their comments to appropriate verbiage and appropriate ways of communicating by saying, we have a statistical inference here that this particular data set has not occurred due to chance. Okay. We have this underlying mechanism, which we are proposing underpins this phenomenon. Here are some observations to support that underpinning. For example, not cholesterol definitely absolutely causes heart disease, for example. Um, Or carbohydrates are good for you, or saturated fat is bad for you. Science cannot make these kind of conclusions, these kind of assertions. What science can do is collect data and report on that data dispassionately. And unfortunately, many reviewers and many editors of journals have lost their way. They have forgotten that. And they are allowing people to say things that are not supportable. And so we, as the general public, we as lay people, are led to believe that science can do things that it cannot do. And at the end of the day, you are an individual, as you said. So you need to do N equals one naturalistic observation on yourself. Because even if the science is correct 
does draw the, the right line of, of average or, or mean value or, you know, expected response, you might be an outlier. So you, you do, you need to look into this for yourself. Now for a word from our sponsors. All right, folks, this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox offers you convenience by delivering your meat right to your door with free shipping. They also offer quality by having options such as 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, heritage breed pork, and free-range chicken. They also offer value with their goal to make clean meat accessible to as many people as possible by partnering with a collective of small farms. They are able to deliver you the best products for less than $6 per meal. They often run promos on their website for subscribers to get things like free pork or free bacon. If you enter promo code HPO at checkout, you can also knock an additional $20 off your first subscription. So head over to butcherbox.com and place your first order. Now back to the show. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly it's a point we've made and I've made over and over again. You know, we, we, we don't have good data out there that can tell us what to do, despite the fact that tell us this, the science is, is settled. We have a consensus. We have a number mm. of, uh, you know, uh, health agencies, American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, American Cardiology, mm. so, you know, so on and so mm. forth. They claim mm. this is this is the way it is, and this is the way we should all eat and, and act and be and do. And and I think it's it's yeah. nervous to, to 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 even be able to say that. I mean, the best you could say is, you know, this might might be helpful, may not be. But uh, let's yeah. go. Let's because uh, more people want to. I'm sure more people are going to want to listen uh, to some of the some of the criticisms we might have over something so let's let's transition away from cholesterol a little bit and let's go and i'll, I'll put out another expression here saturated fat is bad for us can you talk yeah. about why that may or may not be true yeah i mean the only reason that i can see in the literature that saturated fat was ever implicated as, as being a problem really was in that it had an association, so as, as a secondary association to cholesterol. Saturated fat is not cholesterol. Cholesterol is not saturated fat. Um, they're completely different molecules. Uh, there is a connection between them, but you know that again, that's a secondary spurious type correlation. And then there's also a bunch of uh, people. Uh, example: Michael Greger who run around and say, you know, saturated fat causes insulin resistance. Well, Michael, so no, <laughs> no, no, no. The combination of fats and carbohydrates together activate part of the Randall cycle that causes a problem. Neither fats nor carbohydrates by themselves will cause that problem. So, you know, show me a study where you, you have people eating a fat only diet and show me that they've got some insulin resistance going on there and I'll eat my hat okay, because it's not there. These are all studies with mixed diets and the problem is the mixed diet, um, for example. Um, so uh, to say, you know, look, there's all this evidence that saturated fat is associated with, with heart disease or whatever else. Again, we're just talking about a correlation here. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, uh, and we had Professor Ben Bickman on a, tile a while ago, and, and some of the data suggesting that serum saturated fat has a role to play in uh, causing insulin resistance. And he quickly pointed out that dietary ingested saturated fat has nothing to do with serum levels of saturated fat. In fact, insulin mm -hmm. was a prime driver of serum saturated fat. And so that's where these the vegans sort of take this information and then extrapolate it in, into, into a place where it cannot be extrapolated to. Can you, for the people that aren't aware of what the Randall cycle is, just clarify for those people what, what the Randall cycle is? Yeah, it's, it's part of your metabolic system, part of, your, part of the, the gears, the working, if you like, in your, in your metabolic uh, pathways. And basically the best way to think about the Randall cycle is that it's a door of a set width. And the width of that door is wide enough to let sugars flow through or, flat, or fats to flow through, but not sugars and fats side by side. 
So anytime you mix sugars and fat in your diet, basically that door isn't wide enough to let both those things through. They both basically inhibit each other, so nothing gets in. Um, why, did, why on earth did that develop? Why, why, did, why is that selected for in our genes? Well, it's quite simple. Basically, what it tells your body when you mix carbohydrates and fats together, it tells your body it's fall time. And it's time to store fat. It's time to be inflamed because that's how you store fat. Um, so you get an acute inflammation, which is indicated and useful, by the way, acute inflammation. Uh, that's what sets your body into storage mode. You're not using energy. Your metabolism is turned down. You store fat. You get ready for the winter. And then, obviously, your diet changes, except it doesn't anymore because now we can go down the supermarket and get more saturated fats and unsaturated fats and sugars and carbs and more carbs and we can eat all that stuff, mix it all up all the time. And we've got these wonderful organizations like the ADA telling us, eat a healthy, balanced diet is what they tell us in terms of our macronutrients. The worst possible advice that they can give. Hey, Bart. Uh, and that, yo. Oh, I was just going to ask about that. Because you brought up something I'm really interested in with this, the, you know, kind of like, I guess a one way to look at it is like McDougal v. Baker in terms of diet approaches where you have one that's all fats and protein and one that's almost all carbohydrate. Yeah. Um, do one we know that's healthy and one that's demented, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do we know though from the, from the kind of the combination, I, I like your analogy by the doorway, by, by the way, I think that is going to be a, a clear way to kind of understand that. Um, but do we know anything about like the timing of that? Like, is there a, is someone who would say, do say like a high carb meal at the beginning of the day mm. and then like, you know, go eight hours between and then at dinner time go a high fat protein diet is yeah. that enough time to bypass that kind of combination or is that just, is that going to be almost it's, the same as combining it, having that balance mixed? It's, it's it probably, that will, that will ameliorate somewhat. That will reduce the risk a bit. Um, but it takes a while. I mean, your, your metabolic systems have some inertia. It takes quite some time to get things switched around. I mean, when you think about it, if you, if you switch from a high carb diet to a high fat, low carb diet, you know, you've got up to a week in some cases to actually get your metabolic systems running properly again. So it, it's not something you can just pull on a handbrake slide, swing around 180 degrees and that's, and that sorts it out. So I think separating your carbs and your fats out across a day is better than having them all together in the same bolus. But I don't think it's going to, uh, alleviate the problem you're still going to get fat you're still going to be inflamed you're still a sitting duck for heart disease dementia diabetes all that kind of stuff um so i i wouldn't w without putting a time frame on it because everybody's a little bit individual i you know i would i would suggest upwards of 72 hours probably do we know that's, anything that's about how, how like exercise would affect that if you have someone who's exercising a bunch yeah, if you exercise um, more than your average Joe, then obviously you are oxidizing more of what you consume directly. Um, that gives you a bit more leeway to play with. Uh, but I guess my argument is, is to those people is that, you know, actually the idea that you need to be consuming a bunch of carbs because you're exercising doesn't stack up. It, it's... It's almost an excuse that people use. Oh, I mean, I'm doing all this exercise, so now I can eat a bunch of carbs. No, you still don't need them. It, you know, it's, that, it's, it's a folly. It's a fallacy. Yeah, we were, we were actually talking about that very topic with Tucker Goodrich on our oh, last yeah. episode. And uh, it was, it, we, were, we were just talking about, like, how is running healthy or not healthy? And, you know, the, the argument for it being unhealthy is you, we see these people dying at these marathons now of heart, or heart attacks and stuff. Mm. And, uh, you know, the, his message was like, it's, it's probably less about the act of running and more about the person's ill preparedness for the, the event they're training for. Whereas like in the past people actually, like, they didn't go into a, a marathon training block thinking I'm doing this so I can eat more, more mm -hmm. cupcakes or more cookies and stuff like that. They did it cause they wanted to see if they could run a certain time or they wanted to, you know, yeah. beat their friend or something like that. Whereas now it's seems like running has kind of this next, uh, or this most latest kind of surge in that being a, 
a popular activity choice is to justify a poor, a poor dietary choice, more or less. Yeah, you cannot outrun a bad diet. That's a, that's a thing that we've heard a lot in the last few years, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And again, you know, to, 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 quote, uh, to quote Tim Noakes even, you know, the, the benefits of exercise are outstanding, they're unbelievable, but if you have to exercise to keep your weight down, then your diet's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, or if you have to exercise so that you can eat a bad diet, you know, I guess that all it lines up the same way. But one of the things I would say about things, for example, like running or, or any long, slow distance, sub maximal intensity type exercise training is that that actually causes your muscle fibers to lose mass to become more oxidative less glycolytic um, doing anything that is going to discourage muscle mass lean muscle mass in my humble opinion is not a good thing we, we are not genetically predisposed to do well when we lose muscle mass, we are, we are best to, to carry the, the most possible mass that we can, um, consistent with, you know, that which is naturally achievable. I don't mean steroidally induced craziness, but you know, it's, um, it, it behooves to be, to be strong and have functional strength in terms of how we developed in an evolutionary sense. We, we were hunter gatherers, uh, opportunistic predators, uh, opportunistic scavengers even. We were all about burst and rest, burst and rest. Uh, this whole, you know, long, slow distance stuff. Anything above, I mean, walking, fine. You know, you, you can walk for miles and miles and not do yourself any major, um, major injuries, I guess. But something like running a marathon, that is completely contraindicated. And that's coming from an exercise physiologist. I don't think anyone should ever do that. Little yeah, yeah, that, that's the that, that was one of the questions I asked Tucker actually I was kind of curious about that because it, it seemed to me like from uh just just from a like a useful standpoint like if you were say like stalking a gazelle or something on the on the savannah like you're probably not running marathon pace much mm -hmm. less like 5k 10k pace you're probably going much slower like a brisk walk to a real easy jog and then you might make a real quick burst at some point. So you're kind of mm -hmm. on both ends of the spectrum, that super low intensity and super high intensity and yeah. all that other stuff is kind of this gray area that maybe we're not necessarily as prepared to be doing day in and day out. Um, which puts a big damper on my career choice, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well I've, I've got at least one, one of my clients is, um, is an ultra marathoner and he uh, yeah, like his last event was hundred K's. And the next one he wants to do is 160 K. And I said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> what are you doing? He's got the same disease that, that Zach has. You know, <laughs> yeah. They're setting the world record for the 100 miles. But, you know, yeah. and, and just because obviously what you're saying, I agree with, you know, generally, um, there are a lot of people that disagree. And in fact, there's a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Joel Furman, Dr. Joel Furman, who was on Mark oh, Bell's okay. podcast recently. Yeah. stating that uh, people like me that advocate eating a lot of meat should be put in jail and, and silenced. You know, we got out this with this sort of fascist communist, uh, you know, sort of yeah. sort of attitude basically. But, you know, he would say that, you know, it's not our goal to maintain lean muscle. I mean, we should be smaller, we should be strong, but we should be small. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, our, our goal should not be to, to add any additional muscle mass and, and that's going to serve us well with regard to health. And this goes into some of the stuff that, that guys like Walter Longo uh, are advocates of, of restricting protein, limiting mTOR stimulation, uh, cutting back our risk of, you know, limiting things like IGF-1, limiting our risk of developing, well, premature aging and then cancer. So what do you say? And when we've talked about this on a number of programs, but it just bears repeating. What are your thoughts on, on people that say that particular uh, sort of thing? I guess at the end of the day, these are people who are putting forward a hypothesis and the hypothesis, I guess, uh, my take on it is that it's agenda driven. And if your agenda is to advocate for the consumption of a diet, which is completely lacking in animal products, as a result of that, you are going to lose muscle mass. You're going to lose condition. 
you are going to lose fitness. So now you have to justify that loss of condition as a good thing. And so you will grasp onto anything that you can in isolation. It's called reductionism, for those that don't know. It's pull one scientific context out, uh, idea out of its context and present that as the answer to everything. Um, it's like pulling one gear out of, a, out of a gearbox and saying, now I can tell you how the gearbox works if I've never seen a gearbox. It, it's, it's just silly. Um, all the indications are that the healthiest, fittest folks are the ones with the moderate muscle mass, the functional strength and power, um, the ability to negotiate and cope with the world in which they find themselves. Um, you know, guys like Furman and, and, and Gregor and these kind of ghouls that look like they could be blown away by a, a light breeze. Uh, this is not a picture of health. Just look at these guys. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, Garth Davis is the same age as me. Who would have thought that? Just looking at the two of us side by side, for example. Um, you know, Garth is younger than you, Sean. Did you know that? Yeah, I think he's in his late 40s. I think I got about a half a decade on him or something like that. Yeah, sure. You know, uh, and, I, and that's just an N equals one naturalistic observation, sure. But it, it's an indication when you look at all these people who advocate for that lifestyle. I'm yet to see one that looks, you know, remotely, for want of a better term, healthy. It, it, they... They look terrible, mostly. Yeah, yeah. and I'm stepping, stepping away from the, you know, the, the observation, because a lot of people criticize, and, and I've been certainly guilty of that too, but I think it does illustrate a point that you can say that this can be the result of a poor choice of a diet, you know, whether you yeah. develop dementia, whether you become frail, whether you become sarcopenic, you know, whether you mm -hmm. fall down in your bathroom and break three of your bones like Dr. McDougall did, uh, and, and there may be a lot of confounders that, that play into that but at the, at the end of the day these 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 things are powerful and, and it's it's it can serve as a useful purpose but many people get mad when you talk about that and so yeah of course, uh, yeah, of course. so when we talk about some of the scientific stuff i mean i think that's a lot of people like to you know a lot of people love to talk about the science and and i always sit there in the back of my head saying well we you know it's fun to talk about it but as you pointed out such so much of the science we just don't know we can't mm. test it really well um, yeah. I saw, uh, I, and I didn't, I didn't get the chance to watch the whole thing, but I mean, you had a video entitled something like leafy grains, no thank you, or something like that, or, you know, why, what's, what, yeah. a lot of people think leafy greens are the salvation. I mean, you know, eating a bunch of kale, eating a bunch of spinach, you know, getting your leafy greens, eat a bunch of salad is the right thing to do because we've been told it is, and there's, there's, there's epidemiology that supports that. What is your take on why or why, why we should or should not be ingesting any or, or, or certainly large quantities of leafy green vegetables. No. Okay. So the first, the first reason that people talk about leafy greens and vegetables in general, is they say there's a requirement in the human um, nutrition for fiber. It's false. There is no requirement for fiber in our diets whatsoever. Um, for a in-depth discussion about the reasons for that, see my channel. I did a discussion with Dr. Paul Saladino about that very thing a few weeks ago. Uh, the next thing they say is, well, um, you know, vitamins and minerals and things. Well, most of those are not bioavailable. In fact, they're locked out and they're locked out on purpose by the plant. Why? Because the plant actually doesn't want you to have its nutrients. It does not want you to eat it. Thank you very much. A plant cannot run away from you. Um, it is rooted to the ground, so it has to defend itself in other ways. It does that chemically. It does it very, very effectively. Uh, there are a bunch, there are like literally thousands of different compounds and chemicals in plants that are designed to mess you up and discourage you from eating uh, the plant. Uh, but one of the worst ones is oxalate. Uh, and your body does actually generate some of its own oxalate. It does make oxalate by itself. So again, this is one of these you know, potentially hormetic type arguments, if you like, fine. But at the end of the day, if you're piling in a bunch of oxalates, uh, which you will be piling in a bunch if you follow the advice by, you know, Eric Berg, for example, 
Uh, and that's what that video was about, actually, Sean. It was about, sure, it was about Eric's advice that you should have seven to 10 cups a day of green leafies. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, that is some oxalate that you're taking in there. If you do that, um, a lot of people think that oxalates are really only problematic in that it precipitates, oxalate precipitates out with calcium and that forms kidney stones. And sure, it does happen, but that's not the only problem that oxalates causes. Uh, for a really, really good discussion on oxalates, see Elliot Overton. I know he was a guest of yours a few weeks ago. There's another video on my channel where I talk to Elliot for a couple of hours. I think it is about oxalates in depth. It is frightening what oxalates do in your body. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's basically it's deadly poison. Um, and the only reason that a lot of people don't realize that it's deadly poison, I guess, is because A, we've been educated that leafy greens are good for you, uh, and B, because it's the kind of poison that doesn't kill you stone dead in five minutes. Uh, it'll, it'll kill you slowly and painfully over a number of years. So um, that's why people often don't recognize it, I guess. Yeah, and we actually had a, a two-part interview with Sally Norton that'll be coming out oh, yeah. eventually, mm -hmm. and just as kind of, a, you know, a an add on with the, with, with Elliot's interview to kind of do a deeper dive in some of the topics we brought up with him. And uh, I think I actually have an email from her asking to connect her with, <laughs> with the Dr. Berg. Cause I think she wants to have a chat with him about oxalates and see what his thoughts are and stuff like that. So that might be, yeah. she clearly watched your video, I guess. <laughs> okay. Right. Good. Cool. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, as I say, like many, many different compounds in leafy greens, vegetables and things that, that will cause you a problem. Um, oxalates are probably one of the worst ones. Um, yeah, probably just best avoided. There's no, given that there's no indication for leafy greens and vegetables in general in your diet, they are not required. Um, there are no deficiencies on a carnivore diet. Um, unfortunately, that's not true of other diets, but uh, there you go. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's always been interesting to me, like some of the food groups that carry like a zero or close to zero macronutrient value. And um, I get nowadays, like it makes sense to eat something that has no calories in it. In fact, in a lot of cases, it probably behooves someone to be eating less calories. And, mm. and, and then the argument gets shifted to like the micronutrients and then the counter to that is a well, the bioavailability of those like micronutrients. What does that tell us about human appropriate diet? If we're only absorbing half at best in some cases, and that's mm -hmm. cooked even it's like, who's cooking spinach out in the wild, who's even picking spinach out in the wild in the first place. Like how much energy am I going to expend as a hunter gatherer, gathering up leaves that carry no energetic value to me when um, there's other options out there that carry a pretty big punch from a, from a, a nutrient from, from, from a macronutrient standpoint, yeah, um, yeah. It's the, it gets really fuzzy, I think, at that point, but uh, it is interesting to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about, um, let's, we're, at, we're about an hour into this, so we got, we got some time to chat still. Let's, let's delve into some of these topics that, that I, I heard you talking about, Garth, and we were talking about uh, uh, oxidative stress and how to mitigate that. And you'd mentioned uh, grounding. You yeah. Know, people that don't know grounding is basically just bare feet on the ground from my understanding. And then talk a little bit about why that is, because that's something I, I really just don't have. I just haven't really spent much time looking at. So it might be interesting. Sure. Just, sure. You know, we might want to well, transition into deuterium if you, if you're able to talk intelligently about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. For sure. Uh, the, the grounding one first, um, Basically, the concept is that you're bonding on, in, in terms of as an electrical terminology that, that electricians and, and others that don't understand that would understand. It's not so much that you're creating an electrical current of any kind. What you are actually doing is you are bonding on to the earth. You are sharing um, the electromagnetic field of the earth when you are bonded to it, when you are grounded, you become part of that whole, you become part of, electrically, you become part, part of the earth. Uh, and that's useful because basically at the surface of the earth, there is a basically inexhaustible supply of electrons, which are free to move uh, from high 
or areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration, I guess. In your body, many of the reactions that occur in your body lead to the production of free radicals, reactive oxygen species, those kind of things. And they are characterized by having unpaired positive charges. In other words, electrons have been rested away, stolen, if you like, borrowed, if you like, whatever terminology is, is most soothing to you. So you have a lot of these things that have positive charges that, that will run around and, and whip uh, electrons out of things where you really need electrons to be. Uh, for example, in the ApoB100 protein that you will find in the LDL cholesterol molecule. So when I talked earlier about cholesterol being oxidized, that's what I mean. I mean, a free radical comes around with its positive charges and rips some electrons out of that ApoB100 protein, which physically conformationally changes it from its native state into something different that your body will now recognize as something different. That's not the protein I made. That is now potentially the protein generated by an invading pathogen. I now need to react with an inflammatory response, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, presto atherosclerosis, for example. So there's been this thought for the last 80, years that where we get our antioxidants is from our foods, vitamins A, C, and E, for example. And antioxidants are substances that we find in our foods that have, for one of the better terms, spare electrons to donate, to, to neutralize these free radicals, to, to, to render them harmless. So, that's fine. Um, we can get antioxidant effect from our nutrition, but it's not remotely as effective as getting the inexhaustible supply of electrons directly from the surface of the earth to flow through our body because we are now part of the overall electromagnetic um, oneness of the world, I guess. So we evolved with bare feet, we evolved walking around on the ground, we evolved sleeping on the ground. Um, it, it's only in the last several hundred years that we have put rubber soles on shoes and insulated ourselves from the earth 24 seven, just about. Uh, when we take our shoes off at the end of the day, we, we are in our house, which is usually electrically insulated. We sleep in beds that are electrically insulated. We are no longer connected to the earth in the way that we evolved to be. And so we have lost that entire um, antioxidant ability that we can absorb those electrons directly out of Mother Earth, out of the ground. So that's the concept. Uh, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, to, to me, to the casual observer, it sounds kind of, kind of out there, you know, a little bit. It's kind of like, you know, it sounds kind yeah. of woo-woo. You bet. mystical type stuff. And so, yeah. but I mean, you know, certainly I understand that there's electrical charges throughout the human body. That's how our nervous system operates and you know we we have we certainly are we, we we the flow of ions occurs all day long in the human body i mean that's that's yeah. clear um you know I, i'm just wondering you know then you get to that point then it becomes okay so let's let's assume that's the case mm -hmm. how do we test that theory what's been done what evidence is there what's okay. the required right. so um, anyway uh, Zach, zach's kind of a, almost a barefoot runner he's a minimalist shoe so maybe maybe sure, okay is it, is it is it well go ahead and tell, tell us a little more okay so in terms of the antioxidant thing i haven't seen a lot of actual uh, empirical evidence around that particular effect um, i'm happy that it is in effect it makes perfect sense that it would be a positive and negative charges do attract if you have a high level of positive charges in your body which you do relative to the surface of the earth, absolutely. If you are connected to the earth, you will attract those electrons out of the earth. Uh, you can measure a very small flow of electrical current, so that corroborates the fact that it is happening. Um, in terms of some of the science that is available, and it is of a good sort of a quality, here's just a couple of things that I've seen about grounding that may be of interest. In a study that was done a few years ago, they had a bunch of subjects that were insulated in the normal fashion, living their everyday lives. And they took some blood samples from these people and they looked at them under a microscope and they measured the viscosity of these people's blood. 
um, the thickness of their blood. Um, and then what they've done is connected these people electrically to the earth. They've grounded them. And what they're finding is an instantaneous reduction in their blood viscosity, a factor of three, which is happening because the, the mechanism behind it that they've investigated is that the charges on the um, membranes of the red blood cells uh, are now becoming such that the red blood cells are all repelling each other and keeping themselves separated out. So you're not having this sort of uh, agglutination or aggregation of red blood cells, if you like. And so you don't have these kind of thrombi floating around in your blood so much. And so the effective thickness, the effective viscosity of the blood reduces, as I say, by a factor of three instantaneously upon grounding. Now, in terms of things like hypertension, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the blood pressure that you, you, your heart needs to pump out to keep your blood pumping in terms of the mechanical damage, the, the stress on the epithelial cells we were talking about with the heart disease thing, that's got to be a good thing. Uh, interestingly, the second you disconnect from the earth, the blood thickens back up again, boof, like that. Uh, you know, that's a stunning thing. When you connect electrically to the ground, your brainwave activity changes from alpha to delta dominant instantaneously, uh, which is a good thing for relaxation and getting ready for rest and sleep and, and uh, anxiolytic effects and all that kind of stuff. Um, what else have I seen? Um, vast, vast reductions in C-reactive protein expression in general from people that uh, have been grounding for several hours a day, for example, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things that have been, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head right now, but um, there are a couple of videos that you'll find on my channel about that particular topic if you're interested, um, where I can, uh, I go over some of the research that's that's been published saying, look, here are some clear um, observable phenomenon in people who are grounding. Um, so it is a real thing. Uh, yes, when I looked at it, I thought, my God, that sounds like crystal waving. It sounds woo-woo. It sounds crazy. But it's real stuff. There are things going on, and it's worth looking at at least, I think. Um, and so that's kind of where I come from, from that one. It is really um, interesting. Did you Do you know, is there any information about just like kind of, I, I mean, I guess you'd call it dosage in terms of when you start to gather some benefits in terms of being yeah, grounded yeah. Because I mean, most people nowadays just simply aren't going to be doing that as often as they maybe would have in the past when mm. they were walking around outside and there wasn't all this pavement. And then yeah. on top of that, I guess pavement is the next question is like, yeah. what is considered true ground? Does it have to be like dirt grass or pure dirt or can you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Preferably. I mean, concrete does conduct, just not as well as dirt slash ground. Um, sand doesn't conduct very well, actually, because it's glass and glass is, a, is an insulator. Yeah. Um, although if you get in the water at the beach, that does conduct. So, you know, um, it, it, it's very much case by case in terms of what's a good conductor. I mean, I guess rule of thumb is the ground is, it's called ground because, you know, for a reason, so ground is, is what you're, you're aiming for. Um, the other way that it is possible to do it, I do it myself. There are those that, that, that speak against this, but I actually connect to ground while I sleep using a standard three core flex with three pin plug. Um, I've removed entirely the active wires, the phase and the neutral wire from the plug. I've actually stripped those wires out of that entire cord its length, ex electrically exposed the end of the sole remaining earth wire, which is on the earth pin of the plug, wrap that around my ankle, put a sock over that, 99. Huh. So I'm just grounding to the electrical circuit of, of, of my house. It's grounded via a, a stake in the ground. That's just basically how that works outside the property. Um, so I am in effect that way when I'm lying in bed connected to ground through this wire. So uh, that's, that's the way I do it. People like Jack Crew say that's not necessarily a good idea because of dirty electricity in your, in your home circuit. And I still think it's better to be grounded with some dirty circuit than not grounded at all. Um, in terms of dosage, I've seen a couple of papers that say a couple of hours a day of grounding 
led to sort of, you know, an 80, 90% reduction in C-reactive protein expression, for example. So in terms of anti-inflammatory effect, um, you know, that's, that's fairly powerful, I think. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, it, it's, there is some stuff available. It's, it's kind of an embryonic area. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, but I really do think there is a, there are some real, there are some real benefits. Um, I certainly, you know, anecdotally, again, N equals one naturalistic observation. I sleep better. Um, I have less anxiety. Uh, I feel more energetic. Um, yeah, all things which are also, you know, uh, coincident with my change to a carnivore diet about six months ago as well. Sure. So we don't know which one it is, but it's all part of a package of, of improving health, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And that's, you know, like I said, that's the stuff that it's, it's interesting and it'd be fun to try. And, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, what the, you know, I can walk around in my backyard, my bare feet. And I'm, I'm happy. I feel good. You know, yeah. You know, at some point we have to wear, well, many of us have to wear shoes. I, Zach, I don't know that you'd fare too well on one of your trail runs barefoot, although I believe there are some actual barefooted endurance runners out there. I, I know there's like some a tribe in Mexico where these athletes have known to come from where they run barefoot. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of guys here in Arizona even I think that, uh, or Southern California too, who they'll run everything barefoot more or less. And it, the funny thing is like, they'll come out to these Arizona trails and not skip a beat, which is where I would think they would have the most difficulty because there's a lot of just fixed sharp rocks and stuff like that. And they just pick right through that stuff. The, the interesting one part is I was talking to one of them a while ago and he said the hardest thing to do is actually get out on pavement and race at like marathon pace. And he was a solid marathoner. Like I think he was like a low two twenty, So he's going at a pretty good clip of like, you know, sub five, 30 pace which is going to create quite a bit of torque and he just said like it's hard to train enough at that intensity to kind of callous up his feet on the pavement to the degree they would need to be able to handle the the race itself so he'll mm -hmm. put these like really thin like essentially like little rubber skins on his feet when he's doing like a marathon on the roads but i mean these guys have all done like 24-hour events on tracks and stuff like that and running around on the trails with no no shoes on so i mean it's it's clearly doable if you want to put in the time to kind of get your feet to that position. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I wonder, you know, just in our natural environment, obviously we didn't have shoes until, I don't know when shoes were invented a couple thousand years ago, probably would be my guess, but you know, we would have been, uh, you know, there wouldn't have been glass. There wouldn't have been some of the modern hazards that we have now. And, you know, we're probably familiar with our environment, but I wonder, you know, how thick the callus has got on the, on the yeah. man's feet. I mean, and, and, does having thick calluses, I wonder if that interferes with the grounding. I suspect not because it's still it's still human tissue, so probably not. It doesn't yeah, it's calluses up. insulate. Yeah, let's let's mm -hmm. let's let's delve into deuterium a little bit, just because that's yeah. a topic that we have. I, from time to time, people people ask about that, and and I'm honestly, I've I've kind of I've seen some presentations on that, and it sounds interesting, but again, it also sounds a little a little bit out there on the, on the mystical side. And, you know, just because it's, it's hard to be, these things that are really hard, to, they're not very tangible to the average person. I can talk about diet and I can put a ribeye in front of people, somebody and they can understand that. But when we start talking about these really small particles, it, it becomes difficult to, to, to comprehend. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit about why or why not deuterium matters to us. Absolutely. Cool. So deuterium for those that have not heard of it is basically a hydrogen atom, but instead of just being a, an electron and a proton, it's an electron, a proton, and a neutron. So there's this added nuclear uh, component, which basically has the effect of doubling the mass of the hydrogen atom. It's called a heavy hydrogen, if you like. It's, it's technical term, as we've said, as, as a deuterium. There's also another version that you can get that's got two neutrons, and that's called a tritium, I believe. Um, they're very, very rare and very unstable. Mostly uh, the stable forms are the, the hydrogen as we know it and the deuterium. Um, the hydrogens all around us all the time are a mixture of hydrogen and deuterium, as it turns out. And it's not just the mass of the thing, it's also the way that it, it behaves in a, in a quantum sense that that makes them, uh, I guess, distinguishable from one another. One of the real um, 
serious effects of deuterium in the human body uh, is on our mitochondria. So the mitochondria are these little organelles that produce all our ATP for us, produce our energy for, for cellular functions and things. And they work by reacting basically oxygen with hydrogen to produce water and that releases uh, stored chemical energy and that chemical energy is then used to uh, form ATP from ADP plus inorganic phosphate. That, that's the, the take home of all of that. The, the protein that's involved in doing that is called the H0H1 uh, ATP synthase. It's a transmembrane protein that's made up of, I think it's five different subunits for memory. One of which is, is very much like a wheel that spins and it literally is a motor. It's a spinning free floating protein that spins around and it's that kinetic motion that's actually used to, to jam the phosphate onto the ADP to form the ATP. Um, and the way it works is if you have a bunch of hydrogen atoms which are harvested from your food flowing through a channel in this protein and that's what causes it to spin and that's the kinetic energy that's used to make the ATP. The, the simplest way I can put it is the deuterium, when it goes through that channel, it causes a misfire in that motor. It causes the rate that it spins to break. It's a breaking force, if you like, and it causes a stutter, it causes a misfire. And the effect of deuteriums going through there occasionally is a, a slight stutter, no big deal, a slight stutter, no big deal. We regain momentum, that's fine. But if you increase the number of deuteriums with respect to hydrogens, you get, uh, 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 more and more, the, the rate at which the motors are spinning is seriously compromised. Our ability to make ATP is seriously compromised. That's a very, very bad thing for us physiologically. It causes inflammation because um, inflammation is mediated by, among other things, an increase in the concentration of inorganic phosphate floating around. Um, so that's a really bad thing. It, it's, it, it reduces the redox capacity of your cells. Um, it's, you know, there are myriad reasons why you don't want this happening. Anyway, as it turns out, in our foods, there, there are foods which are depleted in deuterium. There are foods that are, uh, are highly hydrogenated, and that's good. And there are foods which are highly deuterium infiltrated, which is very bad. Um, animal protein and animal fat is very, very deuterium depleted. It's very poor in deuterium. It's very good for us in that respect. Guess what isn't? <laughs> okay. Anything containing any significant amount of um, glucose or glucose starch, oligosaccharides or fructose, all of those things are highly, highly deuterated. They are the way the Krebs cycle works uh, when these things are constructed by the plants, they're put together in such a way that most of the, when you see the CH, CH, CH structures of these carbohydrates from plants, actually mostly it's CD, 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 CD. Um, they are highly deuterated. They are very poisonous to your mitochondria in that respect. One of the many reasons why a plant-based diet is completely contraindicated. Um, so that's the theory. Um, basically, in a nutshell, in the, in the simplest terms I can muster. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's important, and I've seen some people talk about latitude and altitude. Mm. Maybe, maybe, mm. I can't remember if it was altitude or latitude, but uh, having an impact and, you know, how it informs us to eat, you know, a diet. You know, it's, it's kind of an interesting way to look at that. Uh, you know, what other things outside of diet concern us with regard to deuterium, if you're familiar? <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, the non-native EMFs are the ones that, you know, guys like Jack Cruz will bang on about, and, you know, rightly so. Um, the, the artificial blue wavelengths, which are very, very rich uh, in our environment, the, the 5G networks that are all being rolled out, um, all this kind of stuff that, again, is, is really um, electromagnetic frequencies floating through our environment that simply weren't there even hundred years ago, um, even 10 years ago, even last year in the case of 5G, for example. And we just simply don't have enough time, enough science behind us to understand fully 
what that what the real ramifications of this kind of uh, this radiation basically floating through our bodies it can have on these various structures um, and that's one of them that, that Jack talks about where he where he thinks that uh, you know that can be a real problem there and I'm sure there are others um, I don't know Sean you know whether you know others uh, that that can cause deuterium issues yeah no I, I, I watched a lecture from I think it was Lazo Boris you know and I, and I you know, I, I, I can't say I, you know, just followed up much on that, but I know they, they, I've heard people talk about, you know, obviously deuterium depleted water, drinking that, and, you know, obviously diet, and obviously it favors a meat-based diet, so obviously I'm all for it. Anything that favors a meat-based diet, I'm going to, it's going to, it's going to support my bias. So of course, I'm going to, ah, confirmation bias. I'm gonna confirmation <laughs> bias all day long and that stuff. But yeah. no, I mean, it's, it's just an interesting topic that I think, you know, it, how it, practically impacts people and what we can actually do with that i'm not sure you know you know it's, so it's but it's interesting another another way to look at physiology i suppose um i wonder what you know as far as well tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days i mean i know you're 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 sort of rabble rousing you know starting some some uh, you know you're kind of ruffling some feathers Yep. What's going on in New Zealand locally with you? And then, and then talk us a little bit about your, your current, uh, you know, what, what's going on in the Bart K world. Sure. Okay. So in terms of professionally, my sole profession at the moment is YouTube educator. Uh, I've got a Patreon channel that people are absolutely welcome to support. Those of you that don't like Patreon, and I understand that. I've also got a subscribe star. Um, I'll, send you an email perhaps or something sure and we can maybe link those things underneath or whatever um so that's my sole source of income um as it is i've walked away from academia permanently i i i, I got to the point where the entrenched dogma the entrenched way of doing things the the I, basically i've lost faith entirely with the process of science, the way it's run. Science itself, I think, is a great thing. The way it's being bastardized and hijacked and, 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 and corrupted, I think, makes me sick to my stomach. So I don't want to have anything more to do with that. I'm still active as a researcher, as it turns out. Uh, there's still a few projects that I've got running with various colleagues around the world. Um, you know, my latest publication was, you know, just a few months ago, actually. Uh, and I haven't actually worked in academia since 2016, so that gives you an idea how long it can take to get these bastard things um, published. I had, I had one study that took seven years to get published, not because it wasn't any good, but because it was, again, it was a feathers ruffling exercise. Uh, it was, it was um, a study where I showed that taking blood lactate concentrations in athletes was completely pointless because the biological variation from test to test was so wide that the um, physiological change in state from untrained to trained would have to be so wide to be able to statistically detect it with any degree of confidence that it was physiologically impossible. And so therefore there's no point in taking blood lactates. Um, fantastically uh, balanced article, all the maths was given, it was all perfectly backed up. Uh, seven years to get it published basically because uh, most of the journals uh, in exercise physiology are sponsored by manufacturers of lactate analyzers. And that pissed them off, frankly. So it was only, you know, after seven years, it was only when we managed to get the paper in front of Tim Noakes that he agreed to publish it in his journal. Um, again, because he looked at the math and said, there's nothing wrong with this. This assertion is correct. Oof. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that can happen with that. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing YouTube personality. I'm doing ruffling feathers. I'm doing being as confrontational as I dare be. I'm not going to do the Cole Robinson style of that quite. I think that's, you know, a step further even than I'd go. Uh, I don't and, and Cole Robinson, is, is, he's a snake diet guy, correct? Yeah, that's him. Yeah. yeah, some people have suggested <laughs> we get him on the show, and that may be something interesting. We've got some... We've got some inter interesting and definitely controversial guests coming up. We've got uh, yeah, yeah. Gaddis, who is known as Slee Ridge or something along those. I can never pronounce his yeah. YouTube name. He's coming on. He's he's obviously got a lot of people that think he's sort of lost the plot. But there's other people that love what yeah. he's doing. So it'll be very controversial. Yeah. But yeah. Hey, let's talk. Let's let's because I, I want to just continue to pick your brain, so to speak. 
I want to so, get your in, insight because uh, in, you've got some uni- unique insight on how diet affects mental health. And yeah. uh, I, mean, I mean, I think that's worth talking to because I think it can be beneficial to people because we see it all the time. We had a guy named Brett Lloyd on who just had a remarkable story about how his lifelong chronic depression was mm-hmm. relieved by going on a carnivore style diet. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about what you see with regard to mental health, either personally or in general observation or any sort of science that supports that sort yeah. of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I personally have a lifelong history with depressive tendency, um, bipolar stuff as a, as a younger, as a teenager sort of thing. Uh, I also, whether it's connected or not, don't know, by the way, I, I have a mild, mild form of autism known as pathological demand avoidance syndrome. Uh, so that makes me quite unique in the way I kind of interact with the world and the way I express myself and uh, that kind of thing. Sure. That's kind of a hard wiring issue. That's, that's who I am. That that's how, that's how things are. And, and I kind of work every day to work with that to sort of come across as, as more uh, normal, more, more human, I guess. Um, and, you know, I think I've made remarkable uh, progress in that, in that area. You know, there are still some things that will trigger me. Um, you know, that, that's the way it is. But in terms of the depressive stuff, the, the bipolar stuff, the mental health issues, that kind of thing. Uh, and anxiety is another real big one for me. I, I, I've had massive debilitating anxiety at various times in my life. And what I've found since going carnivore is that all of those things have, have, have literally evaporated, melted away. Uh, I just, I, there's just not even issues for me anymore at all. And my theory on it is that all these kind of things, these mental health issues largely are expressed in people who have chronic systemic inflammation and particularly inflammation of the brain tissue. And the carnivore diet being so highly anti-inflammatory can resolve or help to resolve that, that chronic systemic inflammation situation. The inflammation on the brain resolves and as such that the mental health issues dissolve and evaporate away. Certainly that's what I've experienced. Everybody that I've spoken to who has a sort of similar sort of history to myself has, has, who has tried the carnivore diet for anything more than a couple of weeks even, has reported the exact same thing. Um, Again, this is hypothetical and these are all anecdotes, but actually at the end of the day, a good, powerful, strong scientific data set is actually a bunch of anecdotes, isn't it? So the more of these we can get together and put together in a publishable format, I I think the better. Um, So certainly that's that's my experience. uh, you know, the other thing I've, I've also had um, developed when I was about 35 and it's really just resolved in the last six months since going carnivore, I, I had very, very serious fibromyalgia. And that was sometimes physically debilitating as well uh, on top of the depression and the anxiety and the, you know, loss of the career thing that I was going through. And I, I know, Sean, that you can appreciate exactly what that one's about when someone takes your career away from you. Um, rightly or wrongly and in, in your case and in mine it was wrongly um, and it was my choice to walk away from my career which I know is different from your situation with what happened to you but it, it's your entire um, identity is what do you do I'm a senior lecturer I teach exercise physiology I teach cardiovascular pathophysiology and then the next day what do you do oh fuck I don't do anything you know who am I now um, so, you know, that was quite a serious, uh, quite a bad time. And, you know, as I say, it was, it was a few months after that, that I found yourself and, and, and some other channels like the Petersons, etc. got into the carnival thing. And, and as I say, it just dissolved. It just, it's, I can't describe it any other way. It's, it's just miraculous. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. I mean, that, and, and certainly, uh, you're, you're, you're definitely, preaching to the choir I, I know i definitely know what what that what that feels like and it's not a good time uh yeah and it's it's amazing the, the number of uh you know people that we've seen mental health issues just improve so significantly whether it's on just a low carb or a ketogenic or a carnivore style diet 
you know, I, I'm just shocked that people think that it's not related to nutrition, you know, when it so clearly is. Um, you, you touched on, you know, the hardwiring of autism. As you may or may not know, I have an autistic son. He's, he just turned uh, uh, 13 years of age. And so, uh, I, you know, I just wonder, you know, because people talk about vaccines and, you know, all these other different causes, genetic I just wonder if there's a nutritional component to, 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 to the causality of that. Because I, I see, again, I see correlations. You know, you see uh, diabetic mothers, the risk goes up like, you know, 400%. So I just mm. wonder if there's something in our modern food environment that's being being passed on in utero that's, that's leading to this hardwire problems. Or, but again, you know, yeah. many people don't think it's a problem. But I mean, uh, yeah. do you have any insight into why you think that might, might occur? I, I know people... Well, I, I mean, for me, uh, the way that someone presents their their um, phenotypic expression, if you like, um, is very much a, a combination between the genotype, what the genes say, and how those genes interact with the environment in which they find themselves. So I, I think it's a rich tapestry. I think it's hard to unpick. Uh, like in my case, the propensity for various forms of, of autism spectrum um, is clearly genetic on my father's side of the family. The, it's absolutely rife. Okay, so clearly genetics are at play. Um, there is a propensity there. The expression though of how each individual person uh, presents I believe has to be impacted by everything in the environment, including the diet. Absolutely. And I think there are things that can certainly set something off that maybe otherwise wouldn't have been set off or can exacerbate a situation that otherwise wouldn't have been at play or, yeah, I mean, I think we can't look at anything in isolation. That's reductionism. That's the thing I'm railing against. It's let's look at the whole person. Let's look at, how they are genetically put together and how those genes sit within the environment that they find themselves at that time even. Um, and, and I have seen, I have seen people with autism, including myself, who have become more adept at dealing with their autism on the basis of improving their dietary um, situation. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very pleasing to me that see there's a, there's a, there's a, a Facebook group, called autistic carnivores where people with autism and family members that are supporting people with autism hmm. have gathered and it's growing, you know, by the week, which is kind of cool to see that and people trying to, and I've been reading, I read, I occasionally go in there and read some of the interesting improvements that people see. And they say, I definitely feel, you know, like I can handle life better. And it's, it's, it's really, really cool. And it's cool to see. I mean, but I, but I do see, you know, cause we obviously, you know, whether we're casting a wider net, our diagnostic criteria has gotten so big that, we call more people autistic or it's actually truly growing in incidence over the last 30 years, which it seems to be uh, would point to something outside of just a genetic etiology and the causality, because, you know, you don't mm. see a, you know, a, you know, thousand percent increase in, in, in incidence from a gene. I mean, genes don't no, work all no. that quickly. So mm. I, I suspect maybe there's something in the environment where we're just diagnosing more people that way, but it's an interesting, interesting deposit. I don't think that, uh, we're going to figure it out in this podcast, but I mean, it's just something to, to kind of speculate on. Um, unfortunately, I've got to do a conference call here in a little bit, but I, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, Bart. I've had people have asked me to bring you on the show for, you know, for months now. And I, and I was like, who the heck's Bart K? And then I started watching some of the stuff and it was pretty, pretty interesting stuff and see you've got a, a nice background and uh, you know, and you share my enthusiasm for, I wouldn't say enthusiasm, but my lack of enthusiasm for the quality of the, the nutrition research that we have available to us. I think it's, mm. I think it's a piss poor excuse. And I think, you know, we can't yep. continue to accept this. It's the best we have. Therefore suck it up and deal with it because it's, it's, it's clearly, you know, we just see so many things contrary to what the, what the conclusions are that, that don't make sense. And so I think mm. we continue to yep. continue to rail against it and, and not accept you know, not accept that sort of stuff and say, look, we deserve better. We're human beings. This is our health and our lives. Yeah. Zach, any, any last minute uh, things you need to, you need to discuss here before I have to drop off? No, this has been great, been great, Bart. Thanks for coming on. And we'll definitely link your, uh, your Patreon subscribe, subscribe, star, subscribe star accounts to the show notes. So listeners can go check out what you got going on over there. 
Awesome. Hey, look, guys, thanks very much for having me. I've been looking forward to this literally for, you know, about six weeks since I found out that I was finally going to get an opportunity to talk to, to talk to you guys. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I hope it's been of value to your viewers slash listeners. Uh, yeah, please do check out my Patreon, my, my subscribe star stuff, check out my YouTube channel. There's 150 different videos here and all sorts of different uh, topics. Uh, and I'm taking shots at all sorts of characters. So it's all good fun. Um, you know, go and have a look. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bart. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, folks. Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.